tonight, the Prime Minister stands firm after his bombshell allegation that India was behind an assassination of a Canadian citizen. The government of India needs to take this matter with the utmost seriousness. The opposition demands evidence. I think we need to see more facts. India rebuffs and retaliates. Sir. Where it all leaves Canada in an escalating diplomatic dispute. Inflation is on the rise again. It is quite a hit um, for us. From housing to food and gas, why costs are so stubbornly high. Don't get angry with me. And Mick Jagger on the Rolling Stones' first original album in nearly 20 years and keeping with the times. I don't want it to be in a retro thing. From streaming to sound, we break down a changing music industry in a Canadian exclusive with a rock and roll legend. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thanks for joining us. Already tense relations have only worsened in the day since Justin Trudeau blamed India for killing a prominent Sikh leader in Surrey, B.C. This is a claim that India angrily denies, kicking out a Canadian diplomat as retribution. Meanwhile, some of Canada's closest allies are watching, expressing concern and calling for the investigation to be completed quickly. The opposition, though, wants those answers to be made public now. The Conservative leader pushing the Prime Minister to show evidence behind that stunning allegation. Olivia Stefanovic begins our coverage tonight in Ottawa. One day after a bombshell allegation, the Prime Minister is standing his ground. One of the things that is so important today uh, is that India and the government of India take seriously uh, this matter. It is extremely serious and it has uh, far-reaching consequences in international law and otherwise. Justin Trudeau says he doesn't want to provoke India, but expects its cooperation after he accused New Delhi of helping arrange the murder of a Sikh leader on Canadian soil earlier this year. Hardeep Singh Nijjar was a prominent member of a movement calling for a sovereign Sikh state called Khalistan considered by India to be a terrorist. His son now calling for action. We need to put pressure on India, you know, you can't just come to a foreign country and kill a citizen who's speaking against you. Canada has already expelled an Indian diplomat, but conservatives say before the government takes any more action, they want to see proof. We need to know all the evidence possible so that Canadians can make judgments on that. Trudeau did not offer any more details of the intelligence that prompted the allegation. Some of Canada's allies have expressed concern. And uh, we believe in order to determine how credible they are, there needs to be a thorough, transparent, comprehensive investigation. That investigation, the subject of a special debate tonight in the House of Commons. This committee take note of the allegations of a potential link between agents of the government of India and the killing of a national. A clear sign of the urgency across party lines. For the NDP leader Jagmeet Singh, himself a Sikh, the issue hits close to home. He says Canadians of Indian descent need to know they are safe in this country. I'm going to be asking that question directly to the Prime Minister. What is the plan now, given these serious allegations, to protect Canadians who might also be at threat with violence here in Canada? So, Olivia, we have a lot of moving pieces here. What's the government's next move? Well, Adrian, while Canada is not at a stage where it can compel India to do anything, the government is walking a fine line. It needs to maintain a tough posture without escalating tensions. And according to a, gov a senior government source, there is no talk at this time about imposing sanctions against India. Canada is also trying to shore up support among its allies, something Trudeau and Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie are likely to do while at the United Nations this week in New York. All right, Olivia Stefanovic in Ottawa. And reaction is certainly ramping up in India, where the government, the media and citizens are angrily denouncing Trudeau's accusation. CBC News is the only major Canadian news organization with a bureau in India, and Salima Shivji is on the ground with reaction. Now expelling a senior Canadian diplomat. This As the news broke Tuesday morning, India's news media shifted into gear. 
The government's reaction was swift and stern. Canada's High Commissioner was summoned and told that one of his senior diplomats was being kicked out of the country. India's message to Canada, the allegations our government was involved in the killing of a Sikh leader in B.C. are absurd. Stop giving space to the Khalistani movement for an independent Sikh nation and stop interfering in our internal affairs. With security tighter than ever around Canada's High Commission in New Delhi, some protesters elsewhere in the country loudly denounced Canada's Prime Minister. The streets of Mumbai were quieter than usual on a Hindu holiday, but not the opinions. I'm angry, this man says, that Canada's Prime Minister thinks of political posturing at home instead of his relationship with India. Others say the allegations are weak. These need to like be more well researched before actually going and seeing such things on the public forum. I think Mr. Trudeau should have tried and found a solution out of it. He should have investigated. And then if he, if he could prove that India is behind it, that is the time when he should have issued a statement. Next year in Canada. For many Indian analysts, it was a shocking move verging on political faux pas. Canada and India are not adversaries. They are friends. Making an allegation at this stage was not just unusual, but imprudent in my view. After the G20 laid bare just how tense relations are between the two leaders, says this counter-terrorism expert. You do not accuse another country of assassination until you have moved from credible allegations to credible evidence. It has been an extremely immature, extremely irresponsible statement and action thereafter. Salima, you're in our Mumbai bureau and I'm curious what you think we can expect next from the Indian government. Well, here in India, there was much shock that the Canadians went forward publicly with these allegations in the first place. So the sense is that after that retaliation, the tit-for-tat move with the diplomats being expelled, that the Indian government will just wait and watch a little warily to see where this is going before reacting further. This is a full-on diplomatic war, a major escalation with a lot of high stakes, but the tensions underlying it have been there for a very long time, the tensions in the relationship between Canada and India. On the Indian side, there isn't that much urgency to make nice. They are more focused on domestic issues right now and an election coming up next year. All right, and Salima, you'll be back with us a little later in the show to break down the separatist Khalistan movement and India's reaction to it. Back in Canada, members of the Sikh community say they're concerned for their safety, worried what happened to Niger could happen again. Lindsay Duncombe now with their calls for action and how police are responding tonight. For those who knew Hardeep Singh Niger, who shared in his activism, fear they could be targeted too. Do you feel scared? Yeah, I mean, we do actually. Yes, we do. Why? You know, we face uh, many threats, you know. Niger was known around the world for his support for an independent Sikh state, a movement India sees as extremist. To that country, he was a terrorist. To his community, a hero, now a martyr. Niger was gunned down outside his gudwara in June. Violence, CSIS had reportedly warned him about. In the three months since his killing, Sikh separatists say the RCMP has been in touch. According to them, they are doing their best. That's what they told the activists that, you know, they are trying to protect us. Still, this is a community rattled by rumors. Everyone has heard that they're being here, the spies are here all over the city, especially, and, like, um, there is still, like, some, like, some of the Sikhs are still not safe here. Canada's Sikh community is the largest outside of India, and there are calls for Canadian law enforcement to do more. People should not have to be worried about getting shot when they're walking out of a place of worship in Canada. Politicians are promising to protect communities. But we need to keep people safe in British Columbia. And until we, uh, you know, look but they may not be able to, warns this former law enforcement leader and security consultant. He says legal barriers keep agencies from sharing information, making Canada an easy target. I honestly don't see things changing, and I actually only see them getting worse because we're getting more well known, you know, for being, you know, the soft underbelly of uh, Western democracies. Vancouver police say they have increased police presence around the Indian consulate downtown. Another sign divisions rooted so far away, building for so long, are causing very real security concerns here in Canada. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. 
Turning now to the cost of living and new numbers showing what many Canadians are feeling. Inflation is up again. StatsCan says the inflation rate rose for the second month in a row, hitting an annual rate of 4% last month. That's a jump of 0.7 percentage points from the month before. So driving the increased gas prices, no surprise if you've been filling up lately. Still, the rise is higher than many economists expected. Nisha Patel looks at what that could mean for interest rates. Carlene Jack keeps a close eye on gas prices. These days, she's really feeling pinched. If we're doing our truck to fill up, we are definitely looking at uh, close to 200 fill. She owns a yard care company. Keeping her machines running costs big bucks. And stubborn inflation is taking a toll. As a business owner, family business, we also get this on the personal side too. So it's kind of like a double hit. Prices at the pumps climbed almost 5% in August compared to the month before. It comes as Russia and Saudi Arabia cut oil supplies. They're going to be high in the coming months. So don't be surprised if this high inflation is sticky and stays higher. Canadians are also paying more in rent and mortgage interest. And while grocery prices aren't climbing as fast as before, they're still up 6.9% year over year. So shoppers may not see much change at the checkout. 41.70. We're going to get some relief in terms of the inflation rate, but not necessarily what it costs you to actually go out and, and, and buy food and feed your family. Inflation has dropped from a peak of 8.1% last year. The economy is slowing. The job market is cooling. But with inflation ticking up for the second month in a row, economists say getting back to the 2% target won't be easy. When you have, you know, record population growth and then just wage growth filtering into inflation more broadly, those are, those are the last real key pieces that are hard to break. The Bank of Canada has raised interest rates 10 times over the past year and a half as it tries to rein in inflation. Earlier this month, the central bank chose not to hike rates. Analysts say the odds of another hike have jumped slightly, but the Bank of Canada will have one more month of inflation data to consider before it makes its next decision. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. Health officials in Alberta say an E. coli outbreak affecting several daycares appears to be slowing down. We are hopeful that we are getting closer to understanding how this outbreak occurred. No new cases are being reported tonight, but eight kids are still in hospital and six of the daycares are still under partial or complete closure orders. Officials say they're expecting another update on the potential cause of the infection soon, but the exact source may never be known. A former junior hockey coach is now on trial facing allegations he sexually assaulted a player in 1988. The charges filed after a CBC News investigation two years ago. Jonathan Gatehouse broke that story and was in court today for the emotional testimony decades in the making and a warning the allegations are disturbing. It's been 35 years, but one night still casts a long shadow over the former player's life. Face to face with Bernie Lynch for the first time in decades, he told the Regina courtroom how his hockey dreams fell apart after an alleged sexual assault at the age of 17. As a prospect for the WHL's Regina Pats, he stayed at the then assistant coach's apartment. The former player, who can't be identified under a publication ban, says Lynch got him drunk for the first time, then bullied him into stripping naked and walking out on a balcony, he says, and suggested they watch an adult film together. And later, the player says, Lynch sexually assaulted him. He came in no clothes on and got into the shower beside me, the former player testified. I was intimidated, scared. He's a coach, an authority figure. He's telling me to do what I'm told. Lynch, now 69, coached for more than four decades in Canada, the U.S. and across Europe. But his career came to a halt in early 2021 after CBC News revealed he had been suspended and then fired by a junior A team in Fort Francis, Ontario for sending dozens of inappropriate texts and emails to a 20-year-old player. Another CBC News investigation uncovered concerns about Lynch's previous coaching job in Edson, Alberta. Parents there said he formed a close, controlling relationship with a teenage player reports that convinced the former Regina Pats prospect to go to the police, as he explained in this 2021 interview. I was uh, proud of those kids that spoke up. I, I felt that I needed to take the next step and do that for them and do it for the 17-year-old version of myself that I've been carrying around this all, all these years. Lynch has pleaded not guilty to the charges and will take the stand later this week. 
he denies what happened, he's always denied what happened, and he's looking forward to an opportunity to clear his name. The trial, which is expected to last for four days, continues Wednesday with the cross-examination of the former player. Jonathan Gatehouse, CBC News, Regina. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky will visit Canada this week, his first visit since the war began. Sources tell CBC News he's expected to make stops in both Ottawa and Toronto. The Canadian visit comes on the heels of an address at the UN General Assembly, which began today in New York. Zelensky was rallying for continued support in Ukraine's fight against Russia. Also, on the first day of the General Assembly, a dire warning about the state of global affairs and a growing climate crisis. Chris Reyes was there. From the very first speech, it was clear this year's UN General Assembly is about sounding the alarm as loud as possible. Our world is becoming unhinged. Geopolitical tensions are rising. Global challenges are mounting. And we seem incapable of coming together to respond. More than a dozen world leaders took to the podium today at the General Assembly, warning of a confluence of crisis that could push the world to the brink. From climate disasters to violent regional conflicts to extreme poverty. U.S. President Joe Biden, the only leader at this year's meeting representing a permanent seat at the U.N. Security Council, affirmed his country's commitment to the United Nations and its many multilateral institutions. We know our future is bound to yours. Let me repeat that again. We know our future is bound to yours. And no nation can meet the challenges of today alone. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, an embodiment of that message, delivered his first speech in person to the General Assembly since Russia attacked his country. While Russia is pushing the world to the final war, Ukraine is doing everything to ensure that after Russian aggression, no one in the world will dare to attack any nation. From Turkey's president, a reminder that the UN must lead by example, by reforming itself to be more inclusive, starting with its most powerful arm, the Security Council. The world is bigger than five. The Security Council has ceased to be the guarantor of world security and has become a battleground for the political strategies of only five countries. Tomorrow, Zelensky presents his peace plan to the Security Council while the Secretary General convenes leaders for the Climate Ambition Summit. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. A prisoner swap between the United States and Iran today saw the emotional return of five Americans to U.S. soil. The plane carrying the formerly wrongfully imprisoned Americans touched down near Washington, D.C., where they reunited with loved ones on the tarmac. These five Americans were freed as part of an exchange with Iran that returned five Iranian nationals from U.S. custody and lifted billions of dollars worth of oil sanctions against Tehran. New research is showing artificial intelligence may have an important role to play in breast cancer screening. The results were actually over our expectations. It's great promise and its limitations next. Plus, the Canadian island that's now a World Heritage Site. It's a, a new era for the community. And later, the moment Sidney Crosby came knocking with a very special delivery. Supposed to be a surprise, I guess. Yeah. Not, not so much, wow. huh? <laughs> How you doing? Great. We're back in two. As of today, Russell Brand can no longer make money through content on YouTube. The platform suspended the comedian following sexual assault allegations from several women. The BBC, where Brand once worked as a TV and radio personality, also removed some of his videos from its streaming services. Brand has denied the allegations. There are some promising signs that artificial intelligence can detect breast cancer, potentially reducing the workload for radiologists. Christine Birak looks at the discovery and its limitations. How well can artificial intelligence detect breast cancer compared to a radiologist? Results from two new studies show in certain settings, AI did just as well. The results were actually over our expectations. 
A Swedish trial involving over 80,000 women tested one radiologist working with an AI screening tool against two radiologists working together. Data showed the AI tool reduced the workload by 44 percent and detected 20 percent more breast cancers. But researchers also found to prevent overdiagnosis and overtreatment, a radiologist had to be in charge. As it is now the AI tool, they cannot work as a standalone uh, tool in screening because it will lead to too many false positives. Meaning the technology flags too many mammograms as abnormal when there's actually no cancer. I use AI and I know that the AI tool doesn't compare to prior mammograms. Radiologists can check a patient's history and rule out abnormalities. And while AI technology is expected to learn and evolve, most of its data comes from scans of white women. It's not yet clear how well it works for others. It also has trouble detecting cancer in women with dense breast tissue. AI is unlikely to overcome those limitations. So we're going to need other screening tools. So what you see uh, here on the left... Is Which is exactly what Toronto researchers are working on. AI that checks breast density to predict the chances of a hidden cancer. We're stepping carefully uh, to dry, try and avoid doing anything foolish to get this uh, new technology so that it's ready uh, for, for prime time. Swedish researchers also noted while AI detected more cancers, some may not be deadly. They're now monitoring to see if early detection improves patient outcomes. But many are optimistic AI will offer a cost-effective second set of eyes that will help save lives. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. A Quebec island in the Gulf of St. Lawrence has been named a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Congratulations to State of Canada on behalf of the entire committee. Why the designation is so important to those trying to protect it. Plus the growing fallout over Canada's accusations against India. What we're seeing is hatred on both sides. The tensions playing out in this country. And later. Don't get angry with me. Mick Jagger on a new album and keeping up with the times. But I want it to be like a Rolling Stones record, but, but, it, but it's got sound like it was recorded this year. Tom Powers' Canadian exclusive interview, The National, breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. A Canadian island home to 400 million year old fossils is now a World Heritage Site. Anticosti was added to UNESCO's list today. The rocky stretch of land in the Gulf of St. Lawrence is bigger than PEI, but home to few people. Sarah Levitt now with, res with residents' hopes for the island. A historic announcement celebrated by those who pushed to make it happen. Quebec's Anticosti Island now officially a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Congratulations to State of Canada on behalf of the entire committee. 17 times bigger than Montreal, Anticosti is home to just 200 people. The designation a result of lobbying by residents and local indigenous leaders. The island is lush with greenery and wildlife like the white-tailed deer. But what makes it unique in the world is its geology, dating back more than 440 million years. This inter a very interesting time interval is preserved and that's very unique to find it and find it in a place where the rocks are well exposed where they're not deformed by mountain building events, where the rocks haven't been buried so deep. Anticosti's cliffs and fossils tell the story of the very first mass extinction in the world. And in pristine, beautiful, um, it's in wonderful shape. We can study this first mass extinction and learn so much about our history. A history which locals felt was threatened. The Quebec government once announced it would allow natural gas fracking on the island. It ultimately reversed that decision when faced with heavy opposition. Anticosti's rivers and almost the entire coastline are covered under the designation, protecting it from industrial activity. It's a, a new era for the community. But there's also hope the designation will bring in ecotourism dollars to a place with very little revenue. We hope it's going to bring development and many opportunities for them like to, to become an international destination. A chance to show off and learn from what UNESCO says is exceptional history frozen in time. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. 
Now get ready for the ageless energy of Mick Jagger. He shows us how a legend stays relevant after 60 years. But first, we break down our top story with this. Emotions escalate in Canada over the fight for a sick homeland in India. And this is getting very serious. India calls Canada a refuge for extremists. There were Sikh families that felt persecuted in India. So we're drilling deeper into what makes Canada such a battleground. Khalistan is their name for the state they dream of establishing. Ellen Morrow breaks down how the movement took root in this country. Tensions over the Khalistan movement have plagued Indo-Canadian relations for years, with supporters of an independent Sikh nation outspoken in Canada. India feels that Canada is not taking any action to curtail or prosecute um, those who seek to destabilize or to hurt India. Canada um, also feels its own citizens um, are under threat. The Khalistan movement wants the creation of a Sikh state, including Punjab in northern India. Sikhs are a religious minority in India, but in Punjab, they're the majority. In 1983, the fight for Khalistan... In the 1980s, murderous acts by some Sikh separatists led to the military's Golden Temple massacre and other attacks against the Sikh community. So there are many individuals in Canada whose uh, family members may have been attacked or kidnapped or disappeared by the Indian state, and they are seeking out justice for those activities. <laughs> Divisions over Khalistan were on display at this Diwali celebration near Toronto last year. Large crowds for and against the movement facing off. This statue of Indian leader Mahatma Gandhi was defaced with the word Khalistan. Graffiti too at this Hindu temple attacking Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. When we look at the activism in Canada, we've seen some of the posters uh, that have had explicit um, detail of sort of hatred towards the Indian government. You know, that can be disconcerting for the Indian government. India has repeatedly accused Canada, home to the largest Sikh diaspora in the world, of sheltering extremists. Sikh militants were blamed for the Air India bombing in 1985, killing 329 people, the worst terrorist attack in Canadian history. India alleged Hardeep Singh Nijjar was linked to a 2007 bombing in Punjab, which he repeatedly denied. Before his death, Nijjar helped plan this unofficial Khalistan referendum, thousands of supporters lining up to vote at his temple in B.C. I would say that it has a long history here in Canada. This professor says the push for Khalistan in Canada is stronger than in Punjab itself. The word Khalistan would be known if it was uttered uh, in the Punjab in India, but it does not have the level of organization or support. There isn't a, a widespread movement for a separate state. Many Sikhs fleeing the violence of the early 80s made their way to Canada. There were Sikh families that felt persecuted in India, and as such, uh, some emigrated to Canada for that safety. Some now fear for that safety, with yet another deepening of tensions. What we're seeing is hatred on both sides, and this is getting very serious. Let's bring in our South Asia correspondent, Salima Shivji. So, Salima, Indian officials are saying that the Khalistan movement is more of a diaspora movement rather than one within India. Does that square with what you're finding? It is quite accurate when you're on the ground in Punjab. There is not that much support for uh, the Khalistan movement or the wish for a separatist state, or what support there was does continue to dwindle. There was a small minority of disaffected youth who do support uh, uh, Khalistan, but uh, the majority of young people, they want economic opportunities. They want to go abroad. They dream of moving to countries like Canada for those opportunities, and they don't really care to fight for a separatist or independent Sikh state. When you speak with older people, they remember uh, 
the days of violence in the 1980s. So a lot of them say that they do not want to return to those dark days, they call them, to those tragic days you hear from a lot of people. Experts on the ground say that also in terms of politicians, a lot of political parties do not want to go there and to speak about the issue of Khalistan uh, because it is a non-starter uh, electorally in terms of getting elected. Uh, some say that how diaspora communities really view what's happening on the ground in Punjab are sort of frozen in time from a previous time. I'm curious about something. Given Canada's uh, travel warning, among the Canadians that you encounter, are you sensing any sort of anxiety, if at all? There isn't much anxiety. I don't get that much. I don't get asked about it that much as well. But of course, India is a very big place and very diverse. There is some anger when you do speak to some Indians on the ground and a little bit of annoyance when they talk about the issue about Khalistan and about Canada, in particular about how they think the Canadian government is dealing with the Khalistan movement in Canada and those elements. So the sense from uh, some Indians here that the Canadians are not really dealing with it, of course, they get their view of that from what the Indian government is saying repeatedly about what they see and what they do not like about what they see about what's happening in Canada. All right, Salima Shivji in Mumbai, thank you. You're welcome. Just ahead, Mick Jagger opens up about staying in the spotlight for 60 years, the highs and the lows. It's very difficult to lose friends, you know. Um, as you get older, you lose a lot of friends. You can't make this all about death. And he doesn't make it all about death. The Stones frontman is embracing modern life and a music industry that's always evolving. Mick Jagger rolls out a Stones album in tune with the times. Don't get angry with me. It's got sound like it was recorded this year. Why it's hard to write songs with Keith. He doesn't do Zoom, so I can't write on Zoom with him, you know. But it's easy to just call Paul. We do to text each other and, you know. In the age of streaming satisfaction. The Rolling Stones frontman sat down with Tom Power, host of CBC Radio's Q, and reflected on the friends he's lost in his long career, but he leaves no doubt he is living in the moment. Mick Jagger. Tom, how are you? Good. <laughs> Thanks for being here, man. This is cool. Pleasure. Pleasure to be here. I love the new record. Thank you. How are you feeling? How are you feeling putting this thing out? Well, good. I mean, it, it's quite a long time since we finished it now because uh, we finished. I finished mixing in um, beginning of March, so uh, you know I was very up <laughs> there. I was really up, and then I've had to sort of put it on the back burner because it takes so long to make the vinyl. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, I'm very excited about it. At this stage, I mean, this far into it, any nerves putting out a record? Well, you always, um, I mean, I think you say, you know that it's, that you like it, you know, that's the first stage and you, you like it. Um, and, and you play it to people, you play it to friends and you play it to colleagues and so on. And you get a vibe of that they, that they seem to be liking it, but you never know when when people when you come out with something, you never know the mood of can be not down on you maybe for some reason. Yeah. But, but I mean, I think it's been pretty positive reaction so far. We've only heard people have only heard angry, so yeah. but um, it seems to be pretty positive so far. Angry is a great song. I hear a melody. I love that it's a Jagger Richards. I love seeing you two on stage together because I've been doing research on for this interview Mick, for, I'll say a month. Okay, like, <laughs> it was long. Yeah, like reading books and reading articles and yeah. reading interviews all the way back to like 62 up till now. And it's funny to see the Keith thing come up over and over again. Like where where are you now writing songs together? And doing all uh, well, you know, we, we did some songwriting, you know, like, I mean, it's so different now. I mean, because we used to be, we, we used to live in the same apartment you know, when yeah. we started off um, writing songs together. And so we'd be, I, I wouldn't even play guitar half the time. Here. I'd just be writing the top lines for Keith's chord sequences. And, you know, and he would sometimes suggest melodies and I would come up with all the words. And But, you know, this, that's a long time ago and things evolve and change. And, you know, um, you know, I like to, 
I like to write songs on my own. You know, I don't live in the same continent as Keith. You know, uh, um, so uh, he doesn't do Zoom, so I can't write on Zoom with him. You know, yeah. so but still, when we got together in Jamaica and started jamming these things around, that was like you know. It's the same as we always have been, you know, so. I love the McCartney was on this record too. Yeah. He plays he plays bass on uh, a track on the record. Yeah, yeah, he does. Was we, he in the room with you? Was it yeah, it was there? all in the room. We're all in the room playing together. So there's you and Keith. And yeah, I'm playing, I'm playing guitar, Keith's playing guitar. And Paul McCartney's playing bass. Pa Paul's playing bass, Ronnie's playing guitar. Do you understand that that feels meaningful to me? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I understand it's a session and yeah. you musicians playing together. Yeah. You understand that historically, yeah. that feels meaningful yeah. that you yeah, guys yeah. played together, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it does. I mean, it is, and it's fun, but it seemed so natural, you know? It didn't seem, and Paul was so natural and, and relaxed and, and he enjoyed it and we, we knocked it out really quick. Did you guys have a good relationship going through this whole thing? Uh, who, who? You and Paul. Going through what thing? Well, your your lives, your like whole life. But well, Jesus, Mick, you know what I mean, right? Like I think if you look at like again, if you want to talk about how much Keith comes up, the Beatles come up a lot, yeah. right? You know, yeah. and I find that a lot of what got written about in say the seventies and eighties, I guess up until the early eighties, was you and John. Yeah, well, John was a great friend, close friend of mine. Yeah, and you know he was very acerbic and funny and witty and intelligent and everything. And but I also knew Paul, who's a different kind of personality. You know, I've always been friends with him. And um, we don't see each other that much, but we do sort of text each other and, you know, and um, so we sort of keep in touch. Um, I've sort of been trying to figure out how to talk to you about this part is, and only not because it's uh, controversial, but only because it's a bit emotional, to be honest, with, with Charlie uh, on the record. I was so yeah. happy when I looked at the track listing yeah. and I saw that, that Charlie plays on this record. Yeah. Charlie, what's... So these are older, Charlie? Uh, 2019. It's not that long ago. No. Um, so we'd record, we, you know, we, over the last five years, we've done quite a lot of recording, but we, it had been a bit sporadic and we hadn't really finished any. There's a lot of unfinished material, you know, and, and um, songs that hadn't been done. Anyway. So when we were putting this together, we said, well, which ones do we like, you know, which ones do we think that we'll fit on this record that Charlie's on and we finish those? And so we put these two, these two tracks we picked for Char with Charlie on. Yeah. What was he like? Well, that's really a hard question. I mean, I'm, I, knew, I knew him since I was 19, you know. And I hung out a lot with Charlie. He was like one of my sort of close friends. And we had a, Charlie and I had a lot of interests outside of just playing a band, you know. And, well, we we used to we loved sport, you know, football and cricket. Um, Charlie loved, you know, beautiful objects. You know, he liked antiques. He liked furniture. So we talked a lot about things like that. You know, so we had a lot of interests in common apart from just being a band. You know, the reason I'm interested in it, I suppose, is because to to the world, Char Charlie of the Rolling Stones died, and how does the Rolling Stones go on and all that kind yeah. of stuff. But I thought, my Jesus, like, A, you lost your buddy. Yeah. And you lost a buddy who's around your age. Yeah, exactly. How was that for you? Well, it's, it's very difficult to lose friends, you know. Um, as you get older, you lose a lot of friends. So, um, yeah, so it's, a, it's a big loss when you've met someone, you know, for like 60 years, you know, and work with. It's a huge loss. But these things, I mean, it's part of life, you know, and, and um, you know, we we had a lot of sadness and Brian Jones died, you know, yeah. a lot of young people died in their 20s, you know, yeah. and um, famous musicians that we admired, you know, and people that I love really dearly, you know, um, died early and, and it's very sad, but there, it's part of life. We can't make this all about death. That's the name of the show. You don't know them? Did no one told you? <laughs> Dr. Death called, will now called, speak. This is called Tom Power on Death. <laughs> <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't know that. That's why I'm Irish, right? That's why we, that's why we talk a, about these things. It's, it's, it's the depressive part. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's an amazing feat, man, to see this band go on for 60 years. I mean, yeah. and I'd like, well, to, to think about everything you just told me, to be honest. We're not going to talk about death. <laughs> but think about losing Brian. Yeah. Think about uh, losing Charlie. But also thinking about the changing of the music industry. You, yeah. know, you and I were talking about the early days. And then you want to talk about uh, vinyls to 8-tracks to tapes yeah. to CDs. 
you're not going to have an answer to this question, but I'm never going <laughs> to. I'm never going to uh, get a chance to ask it to you. So I'm going to ask it to you anyway. How do you lead a band through all that? By staying abreast of what's going on. What do you mean? Well, you you have to kind of vaguely. I'm not saying I'm slavishly um, um, trying to you know be at the cutting edge of everything, but you have to understand how things work. You know, in in the current world. The record business being a business of technology, it, it never stays never stays the same. It never stayed the same, ever. But I've talked to people who are of your generation in music, and some who are still making music, yeah. and a lot of them are sort of mired in nostalgia. And yeah. they'll say to me things like, Tom, it was never as good as it was back in there. Or like, I'm not even gonna put my stuff on, I'm not even gonna put my stuff on <laughs> Spotify, or you know? They get, they get uh, sort of uh, fortified in yeah. an era, but you've never seemed to do that. Well, no, but you don't wanna do that. That's ridiculous. Because you're available on everything, you know. You wanna buy a, a vinyl Rolling Stones record, you can buy one if you wanna but buy But not just format. Kind of everything. Like yeah, the Rolling Stones are never, you never allow them to be fortified in like a retro thing. Yeah. That's no, no. important. I don't want it to be in a retro thing. And uh, this album, the, the, the Hackney Diamonds album, I mean, I want it to be true to the school, you know, I want it to be like a Rolling Stones record, but, but, it, but it's got sound like it was recorded this year, you know, the, the sonic levels of, and the, the way it sounds has got to sound like now. And if you listen to it, compared to an old Rolling Stones record, it's very, very different. Very, very, very different, yeah. yeah. But still has that heart, and I, I loved it, and we have to, I, I'm getting the boot. But I'll tell you, man, I love the record. Thank you. Uh, I hope it's not the last one. No, it's not. We were two-thirds uh, through the next one. So shall I see you again in a couple of years? Yeah, yeah right. hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much, Tom. Listen, I, uh, you'll last, I might not. That's oh, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Thanks very Thanks, much. Thanks, Mick, I appreciate it. Thank you. So this is a news show, and lucky for us, you actually made news in this interview. What are people saying? Thank God I did, or I never would have got on The National, <laughs> I tell you that much. Um, people are talking about a couple of things. One, Keith Richards doesn't use Zoom, so when they have to write, it's a little bit more challenging. Mm. I love the idea that Keith says no to that part of technology. But the main thing that's making news is the last point that Mick made, that this is not their last album. And at 80 years old, he's starting work on a new Rolling Stones album. So you're one of the few people who's actually heard the current album, the one that's about to be released. Can you give us a, a, a sense of what fans are about to hear? Modern, modern, modern. This was produced by a guy named Andy Watt who was born in 1990. At that point, the Rolling Stones were already like, are they still going? Are they too old to be on the road? This is someone who's worked with Justin Bieber, with Post Malone, taking a modern approach to the Rolling Stones, which makes sense, Adrian, because as Mick Jagger told me in the interview, the last thing they want to be is retro. Fantastic, Tom Power, thank you. Thanks for having me. Tom and Mick Jagger had a longer conversation than what you just saw. So for the full interview, you can go to YouTube and search Q with Tom Power. Coming up, a very special delivery for these hockey fans. Well, my daughter's the one that broke down into tears. Sidney Crosby himself delivering tickets and memories in our moment. Okay. Sidney Crosby has delivered a lot of perfect passes over the course of his career, but yesterday he was delivering something else, season's tickets. So for a family of lifelong Penguins fans, seeing Sid the Kid walking down their driveway was the opportunity of a lifetime, and their lucky day is our moment. It's supposed to be a surprise, I guess. Yeah. Not, not so much, wow. huh? <laughs> How you doing? I got a call last week asking me if I would be available on Monday to have my tickets delivered to me by a player. And yesterday, a TV truck started pulling up. My neighbors are all inquiring about what the heck's going on here. But it, it, it was exciting. I had no idea who the player was going to be. We were all hoping it was Sydney. Nice to meet you. The car pulled up on the other side of the street. My family are st start saying, oh, we think it's Sydney. It looks like Sydney. Yeah. And then he come walking around in front of the car. And uh, you know, everybody got a big smile. And we were excited. Everyone's got a jersey, too. <laughs> but my daughter's the one that broke down into tears. She was just so so excited about it. He was just a great guy. He was easy going, you know, whatever he asked him. He talked like he knew us. You know, for him, this every day, but for us, it was, it was just such a big event. You know, he's, he's, he's our captain. I really lucked out on this. It was like I got the grand prize. It, it couldn't have been any more than it was yesterday. Yeah, what a great day. So Bill Radichai, a little story about him. He was a police officer, he used to work at the airport. So he would collect hockey pucks and get them signed by like Gretzky and Bobby Orr and Gordie Howe. The only one he didn't have was Sid the Kid. And so of course, Sidney Crosby signed the puck because he's Sidney Crosby. 
for all of us here at The National. Thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrienne Arsenault. Take care.